What's up guys, I'm Dave Klein, and welcome to my Sekiro lore series. While the overall story and lore of Sekiro is much more straightforward than the Soulsborne series, I still thought it would be fun to go over some of the more interesting parts and background to it, as some of the past is definitely more obscure. There will be major spoilers ahead, and I'll be starting with near end game information, so you have been warned. The Divine Dragon of the Ever Blossom came from the West long ago, eventually making its way to this land. Some parts of Ashina are exceedingly old. Water coursing through her ancient rocks and soil allowed the dragon to take root. In ancient times, a divine dragon gifted with immortality traveled to a divine realm in Japan. While the dragon is stated to be from the West, this could mean a couple different things. It could be China, with the dragon coming from the mainland next to Japan. However, it could potentially refer to traveling to another divine realm, and here's why. Sekiro has heavy Buddhist themes, and one form of Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism, Amitabha, which is popular in Japan to this day, seems to be present in Sekiro. To be perfectly clear, I'm by no stretch an expert in Buddhism, so I'm linking my sources in the description for this. Within this belief, a monk, Dharmakara, presided in a Sukhavati, translated to Land of Bliss, also referred to as the Western Paradise of the Buddha Amitabha. There are different Pure Lands, but this one, as noted, is often referred to as the Western Paradise, so it could also potentially be that the Divine Dragon came from the Western Paradise. You may notice that throughout the game, you can actually travel into a few types of divine realms through prayer, one being through praying to the kind-faced Buddha, who resembles the Juichi Men Kanon, which, interestingly, is also part of Pure Land Buddhism. This brings you to have visions and, perhaps, clarity. Bear in mind, a goal of Buddhism is enlightenment, so you could say Sekiro is enlightened when he does this. Another example is praying to the Buddha at Senpo Temple, which brings you to the Hall of Illusions. And finally, we have the shrine at the top of Fountainhead Palace. Interestingly, here, rather than the statues of Buddha, we find who the game refers to as a shrine maiden who's sleeping soundly. As one of my viewers, Yuki Dosado RS, pointed out to me in my Let's Play of Sekiro, this girl is wearing a Hagoromo, or feather dress. Typically, this is something that Tenyo, a female form of Tenin, would wear. Tenin are believed to live in the Buddhist heaven as the companions of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Some legends also make certain Tenin solitary creatures living on mountain peaks. Pilgrims sometimes climb these mountains in order to meet the holy spirits. Notably, the shrine is found at the peak of a mountain, so all of this would make it seem like the female figure at the shrine is a Tenyo, likely acting as an aid to the divine dragon, and perhaps as there's no Buddha here to pray to, it's possible that she is in part how Sekiro and others could access the divine realm where the divine dragon resides. Another interesting thing about the Divine Dragon is that it's specifically of the Everblossom, with the Everblossom being a Sakura tree that never withers. Sakura trees have heavy symbology in Japan as they're associated with mortality, the graceful acceptance of one's own destiny and of their karma. This is due to the fact that they bloom in mass, which is a stunning sight, but the well-known bright pink flowers quickly wither and die prior to the tree leaves coming out with some popular variations lasting as short as a week. So with that, an Everblossom would seemingly represent immortality, for as Emma tells us, the Everblossom is a Sakura tree that Lord Takeru brought from his homeland. It's quite a mysterious one at that. It was constantly in bloom even outside of spring. We see this in game as well, for once Sekiro enters Fountainhead Palace, it's filled with constantly blooming Sakura trees. We see with the divine grass, one small part of Ashina is exceedingly old. The ancient soil, rocks, and water that pervaded the land are said to have attracted the attention of the gods. With all of this, I believe the quote, some parts of Ashina are exceedingly old, water coursing through her ancient rocks and soil allowed the dragon to take root, is in part referring to the ever blossom itself and the ability for the Sakura tree to grow, as I think the divine dragon and ever blossom are interwoven. In first encountering the dragon, it appears to be a tree in the distance before truly coming to its divine form. All of this is going to become incredibly important as we get to the dragon's heritage, but for now, keep all of this in mind as we head a little lower into the location of many ever blossoms and 
in the Fountainhead Palace. In a realm seemingly between the divine and earthly, on top of a mountain lies the Fountainhead Palace, a palace of worship for the divine dragon and flowing with the rejuvenating waters and everblossom sakura trees. The Fountainhead Palace is inhabited by Mibu villagers, Fountainhead nobles, and the Okami clan. While it seems the nobles always presided there, the Mibu villagers and Okami clan are another case. In ancient times, the Ashina clan utilized the Sabimaru, which was forged by the Ashina clan to resist the inhuman evil that had invaded Ashina in times long forgotten. As the Sabimaru memo elaborates, Sabimaru was wielded in wars of old and is a national treasure of Ashina. Supposedly the blade's poisonous blue rust could drive off even the inhuman Okami warrior woman. Wielded in wars of old, the blade's blue rust was used to drive off inhuman Okami warrior woman. Even now, it is likely to be effective against their descendants. And who were these inhuman Okami warrior women? Well, we know that outside of losing to the Ashina, they sought the Fountainhead and the Divine Realm. We can find Okami's ancient texts properly detailing how to reach the Divine Realm, and we know that they eventually did for certain, as the Dancing Dragon Mask tells us, the Okami warrior woman would wear this to the Fountainhead Palace. There they would dance as an offering for the dragon. In visiting the Divine Realm, we can find the Okami leader Shizu and find what these Okami look like. All of them wear masks, which could potentially represent something ceremonial to them. So, we know the Divine Realm is inhabited by the Inhuman Okami clan who would end up finding it. It also seems Mibu villagers had access to the Divine Realm through a ceremony using Shelter Stones. Stones will sometimes appear in the bodies of those who have long drank from the Fountainhead waters. Step into the marital shrine and offer the fragrant, auspicious stone. Shelter stones such as this are an auspicious omen, sweetly scented for bridal offering. The palanquin awaits with open arms. Within Fountainhead Palace, two Mibu women can be found, as well as a Mibu manor, indicating some would be transported here. And, for a time at least, these three seem to live in harmony. There are some translation notes that are worth talking about with Fountainhead Palace, one primarily brought up by the Reddit user e Cone, who worked on a retranslation patch for the game. Apparently, Fountainhead Palace was named with the character of Minamoto. While Fountainhead Waters could mean waters from source, and likewise, Fountainhead Palace could mean Palace of Source, it's worth noting that there's actually a famous Japanese royal clan named the Minamoto clan. According to e Kone, the Minamoto had fallen out of power mostly by the Sengoku period, but were still of the royal bloodline, which explains how they managed to have a fancy palace over on a mountain. It's also notable that the Minamoto were most dominant in the Heian period and during the Genpei War. The reason this is so notable is due to the type of armor the various Okami are wearing at Fountainhead Palace. This samurai armor they wear dates to before the Sengoku period, and while I'm not sure of the exact era of the armor, it seems it was either from the Heian period of 794 to 1185, or from the Kamakura period, which was 1184 to 1333. As the Sengoku period, which is when the game takes place, starts in 1467, it seems likely that before the 13th century was around when the Okami clan invaded Ashina. And with that, let's talk about what was happening down in real world Japan. In 1467, a civil war broke out in Japan. While there was an emperor who was considered divine, he was mostly a figurehead, with the shogun being the real military leader of the country. However, there was a problem. The current shogun, Ashikaga Yoshimasa, had two potential heirs, his brother and a surprise son. This lit tensions between themselves and other factions, igniting the Onin War, kickstarting what's considered to be the Sengoku period. By the end of the war in 1477, there was no clear winner, and Japan was divided with local daimyos, feudal lords and rulers of clans. By this point, the shogunate had already been losing control over the various daimyo, and the Onin War seemed to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Civil wars and rebellions rocked all over Japan, with various daimyo fighting for control over individual territories. 
In the end, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu would unify Japan, working together to win a multitude of battles against other clans and factions for control. It was around 1560 Nobunaga became truly active and would become the purveying daimyo attempting to unify Japan. He died in 1582 when his own general, Akechi Mitsuhide, betrayed him, attacking his retainers and cornering him inside the temple Honoji. Here, Oda Nobunaga committed seppuku. Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who had begun as a peasant and sandal bearer to the Oda clan, had risen up through the ranks so effectively, Oda Nobunaga anointed him daimyo over three districts. After Nobunaga's death, it was Hideyoshi who would defeat Akechi Mitsuhide and therefore gain even more power and influence. Toyotome Hideyoshi, who died in 1598, created the Council of Five Elders, appointing five regents to rule and guard his son until his son was old enough to rule Japan. One of these was Tokugawa Ieyasu, who had been a major ally of both Nobunaga and Hideyoshi this entire time. However, Ieyasu made moves to become the next ruler. This all culminated in the Battle of Sekigahara, where Tokugawa Ieyasu and allies fought off against Ishida Mitsunari, a powerful daimyo in his own right, and allies. Tokugawa won the battle in 1600, and in 1603 he received the title of Shogun from the Empire, effectively starting the Tokugawa Shogunate. And, somewhere during the middle of this is the setting to Sekiro. According to Ishii and Ashina, before this land was, it was a place where we, the Ashina people, lived, where the waters flowed straight from the source. We were a people who loved our country dearly, and we made good sake to boot, but we were heretics and we were weak. Naturally, we were overrun, trampled into submission. For many long, excruciating years, we couldn't even pray at the water from the springs. Ashina was overrun and taken over by an unknown clan. But in the closing years of the Sengoku era, Japan was consumed by perpetual conflict. The fires of war raged on, spreading deep into the mountains to the land of Ashina. And as Ishin Ashina tells us, amidst the chaos that was Japan, the endless casualties, the flames of war, we found the perfect opportunity to take back our land. During the coup, Ishin Ashina took charge, becoming known as the Sword Saint for his extreme skill in combat. He defeated General Tamura to finally win the battle and wrest the lands back into Ashina control and the control of the Ashina clan. At his peak, Ishin Ashina devoted himself to deadly conflict in pursuit of strength, a single-minded killing machine of a man. While it's not entirely clear who it was that the Ashina clan fought off against, I find it likely this was the Interior Ministry and Central Forces, who, by the time the game takes place, will end up invading to take back the land for themselves. The reason I say this is due to a line we get between Emma and the Sculptor upon spying on them. While eavesdropping after the Interior Ministry has begun their invasion upon Ashina, Emma informs Sculptor that the Central Forces have arrived at Ashina. To this, the Sculptor responds, Are they now? They never change their thieving ways. In talking to Ishin Ashina after giving him Ashina Sake and asking him about the coup, he responds, Oh, the rebellion? We just took back what was stolen from us. I think it's pretty clear, putting these lines together, it was the Central Forces and Interior Ministry who initially took Ashina from them in the first place, and the Ashina clan utilized the turmoil of the Sengoku era to take their lands back. Notably, there was a real-life Ashina clan who were defeated by Date Masamune in 1589, so this could potentially be who the Interior Ministry represents. It could also have potentially been Tokugawa, Oda, or Toyotomi's forces, as they were trying to unify Japan and would be coming from central Japan. A discrepancy, purely historically, is Date Masamune actually wouldn't serve under Tokugawa Ieyasu until 1590, one year after he historically defeated Ashina. Another thing I found out, thanks to Federico Filippini and the comments of my Clan Sekiro lore video, is the red color of armor the Interior Ministry wears is the same as the Japanese Takeda Clan. The Takeda Clan was defeated by Oda Nobunaga and Tokugawa Ieyasu in 1575 in the Battle of Nagashino and fell into quick decline. Point is, it's hard to say who the Interior Ministry and Central Forces are supposed to represent. I say the game is very loosely based on historical events, but it's still fun to think about.
with General Tamura and the enemy defeated, Ishin Ashina once again took back the land of Ashina for its people. During his 20 year reign, he would adopt a grandson, Genichiro, and rename him Genichiro Ashina. There was an important healer named Dogen who would work with the Ashina people creating all kinds of medicines and acting as a healer. He had a couple of apprentices we know of, one being Dojun and the other being Emma. Emma would end up succeeding Dogen and become Ishin's doctor. An alliance seemed to be formed with the nearby Senpo Temple. Something important to note about the Sengoku period is the Buddhist Sohei, or warrior monks. As they weren't part of samurai clans, and they were Buddhist temples devoted to religion, they typically built their temples wherever they pleased and weren't necessarily a part of the ruling clan, even if their temple was within that territory. It's honestly not clear if this alliance was specifically formed with Ishin or the ruler to be when Ishin dies, Genichiro, but we can overhear Senpo Assassin state that the land of Ashina will not last much longer, even with Genichiro on our side. And it was around this time that the Divine Realm and Ashina would intersect with each other. For some reason I honestly don't know, Lord Takeru and Lady Tomoe would descend from Fountainhead Palace and the Divine Realm to Ashina. Lord Takeru had the bloodline of the dragon's heritage, and Lady Tomoe acted as his retainer. They resided at Ashina Castle, and Emma recalls that in her youth, back then, Lord Genichiro and I would come here a lot. Lord Takeru would play the flute, and Lady Tomoe would dance under the Everblossom. It was a wonderful sight. We do know of flute players throughout the game, always in the form of Mist or Fountainhead Nobles. We also know of one race who likes to dance, the Inhuman Okami Clan members. We can find them in Fountainhead Palace dancing as other Okami Clan members watch. Lord Takeru's fragrant flower note tells us, it is said that relatives of Tomoe once gathered the Fountainhead fragrance and arrived at the palace. And we know the clan who would successfully find their way to the Fountainhead Palace was indeed the Okami Clan, with this cementing not only that Lady Tomoe is part of the Okami Clan, but also that Lord Takeru is part of a different race entirely. Some more fun connections are that Genichiro's way of Tomoe is specifically when he uses lightning to face off against you. We see lightning frequently used elsewhere in the game, specifically at Fountainhead Palace by both the animals residing there and the Okami warriors who face off against Sekiro. With his country on the brink of defeat, Genichiro took to heretical arts and mastered the lightning of Tomoe. Such heresy may be the key to saving her. But why is this heretical? Well, according to the Floating Passage text, this technique belongs to the Ashina Sword School, though it has been deemed heretical due to its foreign origin. Its foreign origin, of course, being the Fountainhead Palace. As Tainuo brilliantly pointed out to me in the comments of my clan's secular lore video, Floating Passage, while in Ashina combat art, it was taught by an outsider and as such is considered heretical. The master of this technique crossed the Floating Passage and descended to Ashina. Her name was Tomoe. And using this skill, Tainuo pointed out, it's the same technique we see both Genichiro and the Okami warriors use, even further cementing this connection. While Lady Tomoe brought with her new arts and a fascinating new way to fight, Lord Takeru brought his dragon's heritage. Meanwhile, Lady Tomoe was made immortal by the oath of the dragon's heritage granted by Lord Takeru. And it's possible this is how the land of Ashina was truly introduced to immortality. The people of Ashina found that the rejuvenating sediment, a particularly concentrated part of the rejuvenating waters, has extra healing properties, and, in my opinion, is indicated was utilized towards their research into undeath. According to Emma, my mentor Dogen devoted much research to his uses, but all of his works, documents, medicines, everything, were burned and destroyed. I'm not sure who, but I heard one of the senior apprentices was able to salvage some of it, probably Dojun. It's my personal theory that Dogen, who was an incredible healer of people, realized the dangers in immortality and attempted to burn his own work, especially as, in Dosaku's note, who I believe is Dojun, just in a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of way, he tells Dojun, my disciples have abandoned me for Dogen, unwilling to dirty their own hands, they all left me for that hypocritical quack. Dojun seems to deeply disagree with something Dogen did, and I think it could be the burning of his own work. However, Emma assumes Dojun salvaged this work, and we can see what's come of it. 
Looking at the abandoned dungeon, we find all sorts of creepy, undying, zombie-esque creatures who are likely remnants of Dojun's research. He directly tells us, I've been tasked with the preparation of a medical treatment using the rejuvenating waters. Furthermore, Dosaku's note tells us, even if I die, the research must continue. Finish the procedure for Ashina's sake. If Dojun does manage to find this sort of immortality, he turns into an insane red-eyed version of himself. While it's definitely not true immortality, he seems to be far more resilient than he otherwise would be. Not only that, but if he was brought Kotaro or Jin Zaimon to experiment on, they seem to have also been turned into one of these red-eyed beasts. I think they did come back to life, but as a shell of themselves. And it's safe to say, Ashina has become obsessed with this. According to the Ministry Dowsing Powder, the Ministry feared Ashina, her eyes bloodshot with the waters of rejuvenation. And we see this throughout Ashina in the game. A red-eyed ogre used to guard its outskirts, one of its samurai guards becoming red-eyed to defend the castle, and a nightjar shinobi can also be found outside the castle when it's being sieged. Ashina wasn't the only place that became obsessed with immortality, however. Those of the Senpo Temple master martial arts in the pursuit of virtue. They considered strong fists and strict discipline essential against Buddha's enemies. However, Senpo Temple was seized by an obsession for the undying, which corrupted their teachings and style. At Senpo Temple, where Buddhism was worshipped, instead the holy leaders began seeking immortality. Interestingly, rebirth is a major theme of Buddhism. While nirvana and enlightenment is the ultimate goal, a common theme is in building up good karma and being reborn into one of the good realms, such as the aforementioned western paradise, as opposed to being reborn in one of the bad realms. So immortality directly contradicts this. The reasoning can be found in the holy chapter Infested which states, for an age, I have been blessed by the worm. To be in dying is to walk the eternal path to enlightenment. Thus, I must become enlightened to understand why I cannot die. It is said the holy dragon's origins were in the west. So I wonder, how did the worm come to be bestowed upon me? And the search for immortality distorted those of Senpo Temple in some horrific ways. They hired assassins who do Senpo's dirty work. Once hired guards, now extensions of the monks will in their quest for undeath. And what some of these duties are, we find out from Black Hat Badger, who seems to have defected from the Senpo Assassins. He tells us, After my child passed away, all the grunt work I used to do just didn't cut it. Experiments with rejuvenation, kidnapping, the responsibilities of a Black Hat. Everything to do with the temple was just rubbing me the wrong way. And throughout Senpo Temple, we see dead bodies littered everywhere. They're tied up as if helpless, and were likely used in Senpo's experiments. Not only that, but they experimented on kids trying to create a divine child. In the end, only one survived. I am one of the children of the rejuvenating waters, created by those who would stop at nothing to achieve immortality. My false dragon's blood was created by man. As the Divine Child herself warns us upon entering Senpo Temple, those of the Senpo Temple have strayed from Buddha's teachings. They have abandoned their faith, seduced by a search for immortality. Should you be captured, there is no telling what would become of you. And we see everyone involved in Senpo, as well as others outside of Senpo, who have become immortal, have actually achieved becoming infested. A centipede slash worm resides within them, and it's my belief that while they may live longer, their body truly ends up becoming a host for this creature over time. We can chronicle the corruption of some of the various priests based on their states of decay. It seems at first they non-stop vomit up centipedes and bugs, until eventually becoming a vessel for a giant centipede within their body and overflowing out of it. Even Fountainhead Palace itself seems to have become obsessed with immortality. If you notice, there are many houses completely destroyed and underwater. It's likely these were homes before, and the pond completely overflowed with the rejuvenating waters. I believe this coincides with a similar type of corruption to everywhere else we've seen. A Mibu villager-looking lady who resides in Mibu Manor informs us that the palace nobles have a craving for the vitality of youth. They can't help themselves. They want nothing but to sap away more and more of it. And we see this from the nobles who play their flutes attempting to sap that away from us. Not only that, but entering the Mibu Palace, we find palace nobles donned in red eating the corpses of Okami clan members. We can tell that these are of the Okami clan thanks to their masks, and the fact that there are bloody masks piled up everywhere throughout the palace. 
It's my belief that the corruption has caused the Fountainhead nobles to feast on other beings for their life, and this is how they maintain their immortality. Traveling into Mibu Village, we can see that it too has been seduced by immortality and the rejuvenating waters. The priest of the village tells all of its people to drink from the rejuvenating water. He told us, let us become citizens of the palace. If you drink enough sake, you shall become citizens, he said. These villagers are shells of what they used to be. If you give the village elder water of the palace, which is a cup filled with divine waters, a drink popular with nobles of the palace, a nectar of the palace nobles, Go ahead, drink to your heart's content. It transforms him into one of the nobles wearing red. This also brings to question another element of the water of the palace, which is that it states, when a wedding procession arrives at the Fountainhead Palace, this is the drink they are greeted with. The wedding cave is guarded by Princess Yao, better known as the corrupted monk, and her true form, which is infested, stands over the Fountainhead Palace. Indeed, immortality would seem a fitting quality for eternal watcher of the palace. This all makes me wonder if perhaps the Fountainhead Nobles would trick Mibu villagers into traveling to the Fountainhead Palace, where they would then consume their vitality. Meanwhile, nobody who isn't under their spell was allowed, and hence why the Princess Yao is guarding this. In the Sunken Valley, we know that the Lotus of the Palace can be found at the Guardian Ape's watering hole. The Lotus of the Palace being a white lotus flower found blooming in the depths of the Sunken Valley, where the Fountainhead waters pool deeply. And, as we see, the Guardian Ape who used this watering hole has even accidentally become infected due to this. We can also tell these are from the same source thanks to fire. The ever smoldering flames acted as a landmark to find one's way to the Mibu village. In time, the villagers came to load the flames and the black pines were lost. Those who defended the fallen were equally loathed. According to basketware Shosuke, all I know is, the villagers all fear fire. For a while, I too was in the same days, and I felt the fear too. An unquenchable fire. Even now, the thought of it gives me chills. This all aligns with when he started drinking from the Elder's Sake. The Guardian Ape, in his first form, is weak to fire. We also know red-eyed enemies are afraid of fire. It is difficult to control the rage-filled red eyes with the power of man alone. However, a fire-based weapon could be a means of resisting them. They are said to fear fire above all else. It's therefore no coincidence the Interior Ministry would end up utilizing fire so much in order to attack Ashina. But, of course, there's one more major version of immortality left to talk about, and the most powerful one, the Dragon's Heritage. Unlike the other forms of immortality discussed above, the Dragon's Heritage is unique in that it causes no issues to the person who has it. Red Eyes seems to enrage whoever has them, the infested's bodies slowly rot away to leave way for a giant centipede, and those of Fountainhead eat others to maintain their vitality. But, of course, while the Dragon's Heritage seems to have less issues for its host, it still does have major consequences. The Dragon's Heritage can bestow the power of resurrection. However, it is not any ordinary power. Repeated use leads to stagnation, which will eventually reach a point where it overflows. This causes those who do not have the power to become sick, a disease known as Dragon Rot. As mystical of a power as the Dragon's Heritage seemed, this immortality brought a host of issues. There was a Dragon Rot epidemic in Ashina once before. Back then, a cure was not achieved, every single person who caught it died. It's my strong belief this epidemic was caused by Lord Takeru, and potentially if Lady Tomoe had ever died, her as well. Lord Takeru's coughs are worsening still. Returning to the Divine Realm is hopeless, and I wish only to sever the dragon's heritage and restore his humanity. This line is interesting in that it seems even Lord Takeru has gotten sick. I'm honestly not sure what this means, and if it's possible Lord Takeru caught the Dragon Rot, but cannot die from it. Due to this, the two sought to end Lord Takeru's Dragon's heritage through any means possible. What they discovered was that to sever their mortal ties, they needed a mortal blade which could actually cut and injure someone with the Dragon's heritage, and they needed the Divine Dragon's Tears. However, they ran into complications thanks to how corrupt everything had become. According to Lady Tomoe, restoration requires the Everblossom Immortal Blade, and yet I cannot acquire the latter. It was hidden by the High Priest of Senpo Temple, who has no desire to sever the immortal ties. Lady Tomoe also tried to purify Lord Takeru, which requires a combination of severing the ties of immortality along with killing herself. According to Emma, 
I saw it. That day beneath the branches of the Everblossom tree, Lady Tomoe tried to commit suicide. She said, Those made immortal by the oath of the dragon's heritage shackled their masters. However, she failed at this because she didn't have the mortal blade. But, as it turns out, there are two mortal blades capable of drawing blood from those who have the dragon's heritage and severing the mortality of other creatures, such as the infested. One such blade is the mortal blade, long concealed within Senpo Temple. This blade is inscribed with its true name, Gracious Gift of Tears. However, there is a catch. Anyone who draws the mortal blade sacrifices their own life. Thus, it's entirely unusable unless the person attempting to wield it is immortal. There is, however, a second black mortal blade which would seem to act differently. An old text describing the black mortal blade. In addition to the red mortal blade, there exists one that is black in color. The blade's name is Open Gate, and is said to hold the power to open a gate to the underworld. It is through this power that it creates life. I beseech you, make offerings for the dragon's blood. In a conversation between Ishin Ashina and Emma, Ishin tells Emma, I imagine Genichiro will show up eventually, to put it to use, the other mortal blade. However, I cannot let him use Kuro's blood. He can only swing that blade but a few more times, and when that happens, the Tengu will be no more. If you pay attention to the line about Open Gate, it asks the user to make offerings for the dragon's blood and creates a gate to the underworld. It's my belief that while the Crimson Mortal Blade kills its own user in order to be used, the Black Mortal Blade kills others in order to be used. And as we delve later into the game, Genichiro draws upon Ishin Ashina with the Black Mortal Blade. I believe that his use of it could have contributed to Ishin Ashina's illness that would end up killing him. Then, at the end of the game, he sacrifices his own life with the blade, opening a gate to the underworld, and trading it for Ishin Ashina's. It's possible the reason this can now be achieved is because, by this point, he'd drawn Lord Kuro's blood. However, I could be mistaken here, and I would love to know what you think. One thing that is important to note is that at some point Lord Takeru and Lady Tomoe were successful in attempting immortal severance. At the old grave in Ashina Castle, two graves can be found, and it's my belief that this was achieved utilizing the Black Mortal Blade. While there's no proof of this, it could be why both Lord Takeru and Lady Tomoe are dead, as opposed to just one of them. But, even with their attempt to sever the mortal bonds, another would be born with the dragon's heritage, Lord Kudo. And this is purely speculation, but it's my belief that the dragon's heritage could act similar to the Dalai Lama, with the new divine heir with the dragon's heritage being born after a previous one passes away. Lord Kudo's young age also seems to fit very well within this timeline, so let's talk further about the dragon's heritage. The dragon's heritage was set free from its homeland and it drifted here to Japan. Its power was never meant for this land. Until something is done, it will continue to corrupt the lives of those who encounter it. The dragon's heritage and those connected to it, it is only right that they return home, to the west, to the birthplace of the divine dragon. At some point, and I'm not exactly sure when, a divine heir would be born with the dragon's heritage. As we know, the dragon's heritage grants one immortality at a cost, and that cost being a point where it overflows. This causes those who do not have the power to become sick, a disease known as dragon rot. For those who have the dragon rot, the natural life force that everyone has, that allows them to live their lives and function as human beings has been taken from them. Their blood has stagnated. And there's something important to note about Everblossoms. According to Emma, an Everblossom is constantly in bloom even outside of spring. However, the Everblossom no longer exists. It withered away. There was a person who cut off a branch and took the flowers from the tree. Without its flowers, the Everblossom was unable to survive. Eventually, the entire tree was lost. Taking a look at the Divine Dragon of the Everblossom we meet, it's missing an arm which seems to be cut off. And circling around the Divine Dragon are several sickly dragons of the tree, vomiting and spewing out poison, seemingly afflicted by dragon rot. Remember, plucking a single branch from the Everblossom is what caused the entire tree to wither and rot away. So, it could very well be the Divine Dragon is slowly withering and rotting away thanks to its own arm and branch being cut off. I think we can establish this is a clear connection as to what's going on in the Divine Realm. But the question remains, 
who cut off the dragon's arm and for what purpose. And this is where I'm definitely going to get into speculation territory. So bear in mind what follows is just my thoughts, but I would love to hear what you think based on everything I said before. What if the dragon losing his arm is what caused the Fountainhead Waters to gain their mystical properties in the first place, making them the rejuvenating waters? And who cut off that branch and why? According to Emma, the Everblossom is a Sakura tree that Lord Takeru brought here from the Divine Realm, and we know that the Everblossom is the way that one achieves purification instead of immortal severance. While it's possible the Everblossom was simply from Fountainhead Palace, where we find Sakura trees everywhere, what if it was actually a part of the Divine Dragon? Consider this, the aromatic flower is grafted by Takeru, who took the branch from the Divine Realm as a parting relic. The dragon is known as the Divine Dragon of the Everblossom, and when attempting to achieve purification, we specifically need the aromatic flower. Our character has been the Fountainhead, but for some reason, you specifically need the branch of the Sakura tree at Ashina called the Everblossom. And Maybe it had far more repercussions than he ever knew it would, causing the chaos we see throughout Ashina. The Fountainhead Palace is now overflown with rejuvenating water, leaking out into Ashina below. The Nibu Village, once a normal village connected to the Fountainhead, now lapping up water desperately seeking to become Fountainhead nobles. Senpo Temple and the worship of Buddhism, as a result, has also grown corrupt, with its monks seeking immortality instead of enlightenment and rebirth, and Genichiro and his followers desperately researching the rejuvenating waters so they can win their wars. Not only that, but even the innocent animals have become affected, becoming immortal against their will. All this corruption through the desperate search for mortality we see throughout the game all seems to have taken place more recently, and dare I say, seems to actually align with the time Lord Takeru descended from the Fountainhead Palace onto Ashina. As another note, we can see all of the Fountainhead waters originating from the Shrine of the Divine Dragon. As I stated earlier, all of this is very, very speculatory on my end, but I do think the timelines from all the regions and their corruptions seem to line up, and do believe it could potentially stem from the dragon losing its arm. Of course, presumably you would need the Mortal Blade to do this, similar to how Sekiro uses it to get the Divine Dragon's tears, but it's still something I wonder about. Another thought I had was, what if someone else used the Mortal Blade to sever the dragon's arms, and this was when the dragon's heritage truly started? It could be I'm reading way too much into this, and I'm willing to say that, but these are currently my thoughts and speculations on it, and I'd love to know what you think regarding all of this and what theories you've come up with. Once again, as I said, the above is purely theory, but given the Divine Dragon missing an arm, its connection to the Everblossom, and the Dragon Rod around it, it's something I really wanted to talk about. While Ishii and Ashina won his coup over who I believe was the Interior Ministry, this wasn't meant to last. Around 17 years after Ishin's coup, the Interior Ministry struck a blow against Ashina. The rich Hirata family, a part of the Ashina and home to Lord Kuro, the Divine Heir, became a target for the Interior Ministry. As Anayama the Peddler tells us, my gang broke into the Hirata estate. Now, as you're aware, the Hirata family is part of the Ashina. Normally they'd mop the floor with petty thieves like us, no sweat. But it just so happens we broke in during a battle. Almost all the young samurai were away from home. It was a prime opportunity. Given Genichiro telling Lord Kudo in a memory that, we managed to drive them back once, but the Interior Ministry's army is far too powerful, it's very likely the forces the young samurai of Hirata were fighting against were the Interior Ministry. But there was a betrayal. As Anayama had told us, the gang broke in exactly when the battle takes place. And, as it turns out, one of Hirata's very own shinobi, Owl had turned traitor. Littered throughout the Hirata estate during this time are Interior Ministry Shadows, with the Lone Shadows specifically being, Lone Shadows are the Interior Ministry's most trusted agents. Each of leader Masatsune Oribe's 17 born has a specialty, from poison to shinobi hounds. And in a conversation between the Lone Shadow Masanari of the Interior Ministry and Juzo the Drunkard, Masanari tells Juzo, Taking the Hirata estate was surprisingly easy. Al's info was right on the money, you know? 
Regarding Al, we later discover, the great shinobi Al's unbridled ambition was to obtain the power of the dragon's heritage. Now is the time to let one's true name ring out across all of Japan. It was all for the sake of this ambition. While the interior ministry forces are driven back, the Hirata estate is completely lost. And at this point, Genichiro himself starts pushing Lord Kudo for the dragon's heritage in order to protect Ashina from an imminent invasion from the central forces. Lord Kudo protests that Genichiro will become a monster incapable of feeling pain or fear if he takes the dragon's blood, while Genichiro explains his position. Look at this mountain of bodies. Ashina cannot be defended by normal means. Not anymore. And... Genichiro turns out to be correct. Around 20 years after Ishin Ashina would take back the land for his people, the interior ministry invades, this time far more successfully. Senpo Temple, who had seemingly been a long-standing ally by this point of Ashina, with Senpo monks even spreading this ungo sugar across Ashina in honor of her military heroes, betrays Ashina's trust. The Senpo Temple assassins don red hats and prepare themselves to invade Ashina on the side of the central forces. By the dialogue of one particular assassin watching over the bridge near the old grave, which is being guarded by various Ashina members, those Blackwater Ashina shinobi took the bait beautifully, not even knowing it was a trap. How dumb can you be? It seems they laid out a falsity that the invasion would start here. Meanwhile, the other ends of Ashina, which aren't as well guarded, begin to be attacked by Interior Ministry members from all other sides, with Senpo Temple assassins awaiting on the opposite end of the old grave to ambush Ashina samurai. The attack becomes full-blown, with what seems to be an imminent victory for the Interior Ministry. And all of that leads to where you come in. Will you help Owl in his quest to rule Japan, even killing Emma and Ishin along the way? And thanks to footage from Zuli the Witch on YouTube, allow Owl to decapitate Genichiro? Or will you attempt to help Lord Kudo in his quest to sever his immortality, with the possibility of killing him to sever his bonds, killing yourself to save Lord Kudo and allow him to live a normal life? Or utilizing the Divine Child to try and return Lord Kudo's dragon's heritage to the West? Alright guys, that wraps up my Sekiro story lore video. This turned out way longer than I thought it would be, and I hope you all enjoyed, including the parts where I got a little more speculatory. I know the ending was brief, but with the length of the video, I didn't feel like I needed to just recap the events of the game. I'm by no means an expert in Japanese history, and have been trying to learn aspects of Buddhism for these videos, so I really hope that I did a decent job at it, and I hope you'll understand if I'm slightly off about some details. I did my best, but there's always a chance. A huge shout out and thank you to my patrons, Invidentia, Jason Buck, and Jacob for their continued patronage, and of course, everybody else. It truly means a lot to me, so thank you. And if you enjoyed this video, check out one of my other Sekiro lore videos. I've been making From Software lore videos since 2013, so you may enjoy any of those from the Soulsborne series or King's Field. And speaking of which, if you want to find out about From Software's first game series, King's Field, I'd love if you checked out my comedic retrospective on just that. All of these super shows, as I call them, are passion projects, and I put my all into them. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.